It is noon on Tuesday. I see the Zoom room filling up. It's time for the Penn State Alumni Association's virtual speaker series. I want to welcome everybody in. We'll be getting started in just a couple of minutes. We have a great program lined up for you today. We have Patricia Jab Jabba Wesley, Professor of Creative Writing and African Literature at Penn State Altoona joining us. She's going to talk about civil war and in particular the civil war uh, in her home country of Liberia. Uh, let us know who you are and where you're Zooming in from, where you're joining us from today. You can drop that information in the chat. Also in the chat is information on how you can activate the closed captions for this event. If you're on Facebook Live, welcome. Thanks for joining us out there on Facebook. Uh, information for closed captions and how you can activate that on Facebook Live is also in the comments and again, let us know who you are and, and where you're zooming in from today. It's good to see so many people here for today's edition of the virtual speaker series. I see Alice from the class of 72 out in Fort Wayne, Indiana and Kevin Grimes down in Columbia, South Carolina, Valerie in Altoona. Thank you all for joining us here on the virtual speaker series. Vicki down in Harrisburg, welcome Vicki. Again, we have a great program lined up. We'll get started here in just a minute or two. Want to let the Zoom room fill up. I see Charles Patterson down in New York. Welcome, Charles. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session, which is being recorded. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom video window, and then clicking the show subtitle. You may also customize your caption view by clicking the stream text link posted in the chat and in the comments on Facebook. As I mentioned, we're, li we're live streaming today's presentation and this live stream has been made possible through the gracious support of a donor and the fund for access, ideas, and audacious goals. Today's presentation will be archived and available on our website after the event. This afternoon, we welcome Patricia Jabba Wesley, Professor of Creative Writing and African Literature at Penn State Altoona. Civil war is the most traumatizing of all wars, a complete breakdown of society sending hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions into exile. It destroys the very idea of home, a war between neighbors, a country against itself, making the homeland uninhabitable. The Liberian civil war drove a third of the country into exile around the world. After two years in that war, from 1989 to 1991, Patricia Jabba Wesley and her family arrived in the United States as unofficial refugees. As a writer, she saw herself as the voice of both survivors and those silenced forever. Wesley will take you through her scholarly and personal journey that led her to where she is today. Professor Wesley is the author of six volumes of poetry, including Praise Song for My Children, a New and Selected Poems, When the Wanderers Come Home, and Where the Road Turns, the River is Rising. Her individual po poems me and memoir articles have appeared in numerous magazines and anthologies, including the Harvard Review, Transition, Prairie Schooner, and the New York Times Magazine. Her poetry has been translated to Italian, Spanish, Hebrew, and Finnish. For two decades, Professor Wesley has researched and written about the Liberian Civil War, 
and the stories of Liberian women war survivors. In 2008, she was an expert witness in the Truth and Reconcili Reconciliation Commission of the Liberian Diaspora hearings. Thank you for joining us today, Professor Wesley. Thank you very much for that beautiful introduction. Today, I am, it is my privilege to, to speak to you all, Penn Staters, as a Penn Stater myself. I consider myself a Penn Stater. I've been here almost 16 years. And so this is an honor and a privilege to be here. I am going to be speaking to you on a topic taken up by bombs, bullets, and war, my scholarly and personal journey here. Before I introduce the PowerPoint, I wrote the PowerPoint very fast. I want to ask you, how many of you have experienced a tragedy in your life? that changed the entire focus of your life joining. Your scholarly, personal joining, your family joining, your country, everything. Or maybe not your country, change of country, especially at a COVID pandemic period in the world today, I am very sure Many of you know tragedy firsthand. Some people have lost their entire families and their lives have changed. Young mothers have lost their husbands. And for some of you, it may not be COVID. It may be what just happened in Colorado yesterday where you got up to run to the supermarket for a bag of chips, as I heard this morning, and you were caught up in shooting. Or because of the tragedy, you there yesterday, you may have lost a father, a sister, a relative, or you may still be waiting. Well, for me, my life was not supposed to be, I, I, I was not supposed to be standing here talking to you today. I didn't grow up dreaming of living in America. Don't get me wrong. America is a great place to live. It's a wonderful country. The luxuries are many. Freedom is free. There is a whole lot that I have gained due to the war. So don't get me wrong. But it was not my dream to raise my children in a foreign land, to raise them outside their culture, to have my children grow without their grandparents and their cousins, or to have my children scatter around the world. I have a daughter who graduated from Penn State in 2016 and moved to Denmark to do graduate studies and has been there three years working full time. I have a son who moved back to Africa and he lives there. I have a husband who moved back to Africa and goes and comes. I only, only two of my children live here in the United States. I did not want to grow up in in my aging years to be, have my family scattered. But the, the personal losses of family, of mother, of cousins, of uncles and aunts and relatives and schoolmates and classmates and friends and neighbors who died at the hands of the war are a tragedy all the deaths are a tragedy. But then I did not expect 
that my journey as a as a young woman who knew I wanted to be a writer, that my entire writing career, serious writing career, since I began publishing 22 years ago, for publishing books of poetry 22 years ago, I did not expect to be almost solely focused on retelling the stories of Liberians, the stories of a country that was otherwise not known in, around the world, except when people were butchered, heads were cut off, I watched them split women's, pregnant women's tummies open as we fled in lines as refugees, split them open because the, the rebel killers could not decide if the woman was carrying a boy or a girl, and they decided to split her open in our presence as a means of torturing us. I did not expect to be bringing those stories to the world. I wanted to write poetry about love, about family, about country, about patriotism. But then I became consumed because of what I saw, what I lived through. I felt like I could use the pen. I could use just me. Me, I alone could wage the war. From the time we arrived here in 1991, I began, I was writing in the war as we're running. I was writing, in fact, I was writing prose before the war. And then I changed to poetry because poetry is easier to write when you have to run. It's easier to hide the blood the violence, the torture, to metaphoric images, to symbolisms, then fiction does. And so I began to write poetry, mostly. And then even after I have finished, I have graduated, I went back to school to get a PhD because I wanted to have all of the, I had a master's from Indiana University. So I used to be a Hoosier. I don't know, I think I still am. And then I went and got a PhD just to be able and equipped to fight my soul war of ending wars around the world, not just in Liberia, but through my pen and through my words to allow people generations later to read long after I'm gone. So whenever I think of the whole idea of being ticketed by bombs and bullets. I'm thinking of those who came to America on boats and came in chains, the African-Americans and who were sold into slavery. I'm thinking of refugees who came during the, the world wars to America seeking freedom. And then, uh, uh, but I'm now thinking of me also coming as my ticket was this time. I, you know, I studied at Indiana in the 80s, in my 20s. I got my master's from Indiana University, Bloomington. That time I was taken by a plane. This time I was coming as a war refugee. And so then when I started my scholarly journey years ago, prior to coming to Penn State, I had this vision to retell the stories of the Liberian people. And then I came to Penn State and I found out I had more opportunities to travel and to do research because of its nature as a research university, thanks to Penn State. I took upon myself to begin the process of having women tell their stories of torture. I wanted to capture women because of the specific role African women play in African societies. African women are not just mothers. Many of them are the providers, the head of the home, the pillar. And so many of those women like myself had to walk through the bush and through torture and torture and roadblocks to be able to find food for our families because the men were quickly executed. So we women took upon ourselves to brave. And I too was tortured and I was in prison as I was um, on a full hunt and, and they were about to shoot me when somebody who was a former student decided he wanted to see the woman they were going to execute and it was me. And he began to say, that's my favorite professor. I went to college and I studied English. You can't kill her, you have to kill me instead of her. So I wanted women to tell their stories. So I am going to ask you to let me share my screen at this time and 
to run through the PowerPoint here. I'm just going to run through, and at certain points, I'm going to, you know, uh, um, okay. Okay. Okay, this, um, the, 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 oh, it looks like this is, okay, no, this is the beginning. Now, the, the, the PowerPoint is chronological, but it's backwards, okay. Am I in full screen? I'm not interested. everything everything looks great okay I'm gonna just... okay so the project you are watching now this is the latest project this is the project I've been working on and this uh, um, academic year I've been on sabbatical and a long one year sabbatical plus and um, a fellowship from the humanities institute and so my my idea was not I, I am not the only one this is the same thing about being being controlled by this by this um, obsession with uh, telling my country's story so i decided that after i wrote these books i needed to allow other Liberians to tell their stories so i'm putting together an anthology entitled and 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 breaking the silence and the theology of Liberian literature. So this is the project. I'm just going to run through it quickly. I've already shared this PowerPoint. In order to carry out this vision, I spent the last four years traveling to Liberia and conducting writing workshops and training young people into how to edit their own work and how to work together to to. So especially women, I have workshops for just women to tell their stories, to learn how to document their stories. And so these were, so these, this is a cross section of various workshops and various activities over uh, several years. And this last summer, I used Zoom to go through and to train. These are some of the materials I had to research and um, to find all materials of Liberian writers and so so the, the the project is ongoing and now i'm going to tell you be, i'm going backwards now so i'm going down to the years before this year when i was um, before the last four years when i was actually collecting women's stories i traveled to three um american cities i went to philadelphia area I went to New York City, I went to Minneapolis. Those are the three enclaves in America with the largest Liberian immigrant, refugee, former refugee, asylum populations. And I, I began to, um, it was difficult tell, telling women to tell their stories. And so I had to devise all kinds of strategies, which I will point you to. So I did this. And then I went, so this is my first trip to Liberia. In my culture, when I enter the country, I have to first go to my father's house. Whether I'm there for research for Penn State, whether I'm there for any kind of research, I have to go to my father's house and be greeted with the traditional cola nuts. So my brothers are sitting there, the whole family is there. And that's my husband behind me. I cut him off anyway. You, <laughs> the photographer cut him off. We are taking the Liberian cola nut. They have to taste it before we taste it. And this is my father, my stepmother, and then the family had gathered to welcome me. And then the other thing I had to do was to go to, um, I was invited by the president of Liberia, who knew I was in the country, to join a conversation to also visit her at the mansion. And this is the time I met her in person first. The first time I saw her in person when I was a young girl and when I was in college. And, and, and I, was, uh, I was an activist, I remember. And, 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 you know, uh, protesting during her visit to the university when she was finance minister in the 70s. So today was my first time coming close to her. There was a seat between her and myself and she told them to remove the seat because she wanted to sit next to me. And so there she is there. And then I had to make a uh, talk about my research project, my Penn State supported research project at our forum. And then I'm talking and then and she wanted books and I was joking her and said, you have my books. I'm sure you have my books, you president of Liberia. And so there she is. And then, and I had that distributed my books across libraries. I even took books to the 
American Library in Morovia. And, and, and so this is, then I began the research in Liberia, okay? And the women you are looking at, the faces you are looking at is telling you the, the, the faces, the, 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 the composure um, tells you exactly what's happening. They've been weeping most of the time. And, and, and after the telling, usually there's hugging and there is, uh, I do my little counseling on my own. This woman was a v VP at a college and she was telling her story. She had wept all through. This other woman is telling her story. And usually I pose for photos before as a way of breaking ice. This woman had been weeping. And so now I got to the go. I went, I, I, my strategy was to get a cross section of women, educated women, government officials, very poor women, and homeless women, women who are lost. I wanted a, I wanted a cross section of women. And so I was in this on Ministry of Information trying to convince these women to take part. Only one woman I got other day. And her story is another whole story to tell on a different day. When she told this story, she wept for an entire hour. This is the former president of Liberia. He used to be my mentor. So I went to see him and he was proud that he got a book. <laughs> this woman, I'm, then I, I also had to go into the public marketplaces to recruit very poor people. And I, so I go and let them braid my hair. And then one or two of them are convinced to follow me. And this woman had just told her story. This woman is telling her story. And then I had to go into churches and do women's empowerment workshop and to be able to recruit illiterate on Western educated women. And I got a bunch of women from this. I even had to perform with them. So the strategies I use for this joining to be able to tell these stories, you can see this women, they start saying they may not be. And then I conducted workshops for young people and writers in order to recruit people to tell their stories. So I had to do all this free labor. <laughs> and then I had to also feed them, okay? And this woman is actually my, my only living um, aunt from my father's side. She told a really interesting story because we're separated. This woman had been weeping the whole while and she brought these women. And then I had to meet with government officials in another ministry and, and do a press conference, national press conference. And this is the minister there and um, sitting there listening as I try to talk to them about aunt being in, you know, and, and violence against women and, and, you know, talk about the importance of me, you know, interviewing women. And in, I wanted the whole nation to know I was in the country to um, talk about um, these issues. And this woman had just told her story. This, these women were peace activists who had heard about me and were brought over to where I was living. In fact, while I was living in this house this year in 2011, I got an email from a Penn State graduate student who was in the country doing research. And she met me in the same house. And she came to visit me. And these women told their stories. This was the, the only Muslim woman I interviewed among all the 100 and some women. She lost everybody. Everybody was executed in her household. So now I, I had to go to Ghana, Accra, and go into the refugee camp and, and talk to refugees who were stranded away from home. One of the first people I met there, the first year I went in 2008, was my own younger sister-in-law, my husband's sister. And and after I interviewed her, she died two weeks later. And then I went back in 2011. That's when I did these interviews. And I wanted to visit. This is the director of the refugee camp, the Plurable Refugee Camp. And I wanted to talk to him about the condition of Liberian refugees who were suffering and needed to get back home because the, the president was now in charge of a country. And I was interviewing him on, on tape. Okay, and so there he is telling me, and then I go through the, I have already gone through the camp. Now you will see the deplorable condition. These women want to go back home and to Liberia and look at the condition they're living in. I had to go into this little uh, dungeon to speak to them. And this is my Mary Kay Blash that I met at Toho. She was a Mary Blash, 
may blush, I think. So that, that is the PowerPoint. I want to get out of here and, fin and continue my talk. And okay. So this is my journey. This is my journey. And now, when I started, I said something about the times we are in. I, the, we are at war. We are also at war. And I don't know if you understand the significance of what it means to be given a second chance. And this is, this, is, this is why I am crazy. This is why my entire perspective about human beings, about caring, about relationships, about family, about community, all the way I look at my worldview has changed because of my experience. When you have seen war the way I saw the war, when you have experienced torture, your entire life focus should change. I'm not saying changes, but it should change. When I, when we arrived in the United States, like I say, I had a master's. And then I realized that in order to do the job I had to do, I needed to go back to school. By the time I knew I needed to go back to school, I was 43. And people say I was too old. So I decided I was gonna challenge that. And I went back to school to get my doctorate. And then I got my doctorate and then I started teaching. But I have never forgotten what it means to have lost everything. I have never forgotten what it meant to live and not know what I was going to eat the next day. We arrived in Liberia in 1985 after studying at IU. We had a plan to raise our children. We born in, and we, we had our university teaching jobs, and we were okay. And then one day, there was an uprising. There was a war that drove us out of our home. You never know that such a thing could happen to you in your country. Our country, Liberia, was the most peaceful. In case you don't know what Liberia is, Liberia is a country that was founded by the indigenous people and the free slaves who were sent from the United States in the, 18, in the 1800s, in the early 16th, 17th, 1800s. But Liberia was founded in 1847. The capital city is named after J James Monroe. Our flag is like the U.S. flag with only one star and 11 stripes. I am from Maryland County because my county was founded by free slaves from the state of Maryland in the U.S. So that's how connected to the U.S. Uh, we are the only African country that speaks American English, the only African country that uses the U.S. dollar as a legal tender because of our historical connection. So when Charles Taylor brought his war, the people in Liberia thought our big brother America, our father America would have rescued us. But that did not happen for 14 years. 14 years, Liberians were slaughtered. When I say slaughter, whole families were slaughtered with sharp instruments or with guns for 14 years. Maybe this is why I came to America. Some people came to America just to escape the war. I thought coming to America, I would have been the activist to help end the war. In that war, I lost my stepmother. 
I lost my mother during the war, lack of medical care for 14 years. I lost my mother. I lost my uncles. My brother was executed in front of my parents. I almost lost my children in the war. I remember the first ceasefire in 1991. In order to rescue us, the peacekeepers had to fight. They had to fight and they told us we're going to fight the child sellers, rebels, and soldiers, and then we'll free you. And so while we are being free, there is bombardment and bombs falling and for, for, the, the, for weeks, but that particular night of the liberation of our camp. I never knew that liberation meant fighting. And then we were free to go back home. We got back home to our shattered um, neighborhood. Windows blown out in our home. Everything gone, looted. But we knew one thing, people. We knew that we had a better chance at living. And then, we're, but we weren't too sure yet because we're still in a war. And then finally, we got a chance to immigrate to the United States. And then we knew we had a second chance. This is why to me, nothing, nothing is more important than life. Let me give you an example. If you think your troubles <laughs> are, are too much, if you think staying at home, where well, every time people say, oh, I'm getting depressed because the, the pandemic is keeping me at home, I'm not playing down on that, people. And they say, oh, I can't do anything. I can only go to the grocery store. And it's just like when you were in a war. I said, no, no. When I was in a war, we couldn't go to a grocery store. We couldn't leave our homes, our locations. There were no schools. There were no gas stations. There were no cars, no cars. We were walking. People were walking hundreds of miles to get across the borders. And even when you were running, you were a target of being murdered, of being slaughtered or executed because the, the, the armed people on all sides of civil war is not like a regular war. It's citizens against citizens. So you don't know your enemy. When we were in that war, there is no comparison. So when they say COVID, stay home, I don't worry. I stay home because I know that this is far better than being in a war with bullets and bombs. And they, why am I going straight this way? I'm here to, to encourage those of you who are downhearted. It could be worse. And that's why I laugh a lot. That's why I value every friendship. I value every moment. And as I was talking about, when, it, when our camp was rescued that day, I had a cousin. His name is Jute in, in my language. It means because of a child, I'm happy. That's, how, that's the name his mom gave him. He was a young man in his late 20s. That morning when we were liberated, the first morning we were liberated, we now saw peacekeeping the force army with uniforms. We saw the West African peacekeeping force. We didn't see the rebels with guns and machetes to slaughter us because even in the displaced refugee camps, they were executing people every day. And we were smelling the dead because my building was close to the rubber bush where they had a mountain of dead bodies. And so he came and he said, oh, Auntie Mary, he went to my mom and he said to our building, and he said, I'm going to bring you food. In the next hour, we're going for food. And they, we were starving, okay? So it was important that if he, these keep us and fed us. So they, were, they had discovered a whole storage of food in some building. And so they came and they told the boys to take wheelbarrows to go for the food. He was ahead of the group. When Jute got to the peacekeepers who did not know they were coming, the peacekeepers began to interrogate them. And when he began to talk, they shot him dead. We're sitting there waiting for rice, and we hear that my cousin had been killed. This is how valueless life was to the war. 
to people who fight. This is how frail we are. That was, that was, uh, that was one of the many times we realized how life is more precious than food. How life is more valuable. The fact that we are alive today. This is why I celebrate even when I have difficulties. My journey as a, as a professor has been, has influenced, has informed my writing has informed the way I teach, has informed the way I relate to people, has informed the way I conduct my activism, has informed the way I relate to my neighbors. Because I have seen war, I have been, I have been there, I have walked among the dead, I have escaped bullets. I mean, somebody in front of you, you all running, somebody in front of you drops, and that happened literally. And I'm like, I don't want to jump over her. And the peacekeepers say, keep moving, keep moving. There's, there's there are bullets flying. And my children and my husband, and my mother and her household, 10 of us are on the line. That has informed my teaching and my scholarship. I don't think I'm a war poet like people want to say, but I think it has influenced my joining. And, and because of that, I'm no longer afraid to die. <laughs> I'm not afraid of anything. And that gives me the excitement to want to serve people. And I relate to my students that way. I tell my students that if I can, I could make it, you can make it. I had two teenagers who were like, ooh, okay? And yet I said, I could make it. I say, you can do it. When my students say they can't do it, I say, you can't do it. And this is the journey that I wanted you to come along with. I came into this country the second time to leave because I was forced to. But I did not come and sit down. I decided in my little, with the help of many American friends, with the help of people who care about people from war. And now this is where you come in as a Penn State graduate. And as you travel and do research and you travel around the world and the difficulties around the world with refugees, with people who are not free, I think it is our place to globalize in a way that we bring freedom to the world. This is why I hate wars. I don't care who wants to use war as a way of helping their country. Wars are just too costly. This is why you have refugees. I would like to close on a short poem. People love it, but this is for the people in the audience, anybody who will watch this. I'm gonna read a poem. Some of us are made of steel. Some of us are made of steel, not because we are steel, but because we have seen trouble. No matter if your trouble was cancer or not, or tragedy or divorce or anything, I think you can do it. Some of us are made of steel. I will close on this poem so you will, will answer some questions. Some of us are made of steel. Some of us are made of twigs. Some of us break in order to stand and rise above the bend. Some of us bend and wobble and rock to the rhythm of all the scars we pick up as the roads wind us in their hard grip and toss us up in the cold, sometimes hot air against the dashing, against the walls of life. Some of us are made of jelly, soft to the touch. But when life gives us a blow, we slide and glide. And before you know it, we've made it to the other side, away from destruction, surviving the punches only jelly could take. Some of us are made of tears, tears, 
tears and we weep hard so rain falls on hard and drought weary soil and then the rivers swell and swell and swell because somehow life has made us cry but in our tears salt healing salty and forever we are forever yes some of us are forever no matter what you toss at us we rise again and again and again like that old river in my backyard at home that river that rises and we say oh the river and then it goes away and we say oh the swamp some of us are hard sometimes the river sometimes the rock thank you Thank you, Professor Wesley, for sharing that presentation and sharing your story. Uh, we want to invite uh, alumni who are tuning in to go ahead and ask your questions in the Q&A tab. Uh, but can you give us a little bit of background on the Liberian Civil War? What, what were the two factions fighting, uh, fighting each other? What were they fighting, you know, uh, what the cause of the war? What were they fighting for, if you will? The Liberians, the Liberia was founded in 1847. And after the founding of the country for over 139 years, the country was ruled by the descendants of the free slaves, mm -hmm. exclusively mostly. The descendants of free slaves were less than 5% of the population. After over 139 years, they were probably less than 1% of the population. And they rule our country like the American South. Many people were treated as slaves. There was a ruling hierarchy, one party government, and they fooled the world and America also believed that they were a democracy. So in 1980, there was a military coup led by an indigenous man, Samuel Kanyon Do from one of the ethnic cities. It was a popular, popularly welcomed coup. In the very beginning of the coup, the very week and two weeks leading to the and um, after the coup, he executed 17 government officials, the most powerful. And well, some people's sentiment were, you know was beginning to change. But he continued to be popular for years. And then as anyone will know that military dictator leaders become dictators. So he became a dictator and people were randomly executed. There were so many planned coup, failed coups, and, and so many fake coups. And he executed all of his opponents and drove many into exile, including the former elites who had ruled the country for over a hundred years. And those people got together and, and formed a coalition and started and sent Charles Taylor to Liberia with an army to carry out a war, a civil war. You see some of the disenfranchised people, some of the angry people of the country, as a military and started the guerrilla warfare in 1989, December 26th, the day after Christmas. That's when they started the war in the northern part of Liberia. And guerrilla warfares are fought in a very brutal way. They take a town and a village one after the other. They do not come and just capture the country at once. And so that moving war, for almost a year, the first war overran the country, killing hundreds of thousands. According to the, the UN calculation, when, I, when we immigrated in 1991, they were calculating at 250,000 people dead from the, from the war. But then the UN fixed the numbers and still tell us after 14 years, there were 250,000 people. I don't believe it, 
I think about half a million Liberians died in that war. And so the first war, the first ceasefire was when I came to the country two years after the war started, we immigrated. The war continued for 14 years total. Devastating and the war, several series of wars, killing more and more people, survivors were killed and, uh, and the survivors of those who died were also killed. So Charles Taylor became president during the war, carried out a fake election and made himself president. In 2003, George Bush intervened and helped with the help of the peacekeepers, got Charles Taylor out of the country. And that's how the war ended. 2003 and the election in 2004, and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf became the first president after the war. And were you able to, during the war, freely travel in and out of the country or was that, um, was that restricted? How, how did you get back and forth to the United States? Well, the war went on until 2003, and then in 2003. My first trip back from America was in 2008. Okay. Yeah, so no, I didn't go, I didn't, I didn't, I had not, I, I did my, it was in 2005 and six and seven that I did the American part of the research. And then 2008, I traveled for the first time to Africa. And, but during the war, when those who are in the country cannot easily move from one neighborhood to, to another neighborhood. Right. And yeah. <laughs> As you teach this topic to, um, to your students, what are, um, what are some of the learnings that they take away from um, the lessons of having, um, you having lived in a country that was engaged in a civil war um, and having fled the country? Well, what are some of the, the takeaways that your students uh, have from, from your courses? Yeah, I teach English, so I can right. easily teach these teach this is um but um every every year i introduce myself to my student as a civil war survivor and they know it one time i got a picture that my students knew i know they know every time they tell me oh if you could go through this i can go through this. you know when they come to my office crying because especially freshmen they think the world has ended when they come to college and discover college is not high school so you have to remind that's why i love to teach freshmen you have to remind them that the world has not yet ended they are just on a different journey okay a continuation and but one time in 2014 i was diagnosed with uterine cancer. And I didn't want to tell my students that I had cancer. So I told them that, and it was in April, that in that day, um, that the next day, no, that day would be my last day. I think I told them that the class would end early after I got permission to leave and um, before the 20th of April. And so I prepared them for all their papers and everything. Then I told them, that the day of my last day, I told them, this is my last day. I'm not resigning. I'm going to be gone for a year. I'm going to be taking treatments. I'm not well, so I'll be undergoing treatment. Well, the students in America knew exactly that I had cancer, just by that. In Africa, the kids will say, why? Why are you going for a year? What's wrong with you? But in America, if your teacher says, I'm ill, I'm going to be taking treatments for a year, students began to cry. And they were coming to me and saying things like, you're gonna make it, you're gonna make it. And I'm like, how do you know? You have gone through war. You went through war and look how happy you are. You're gonna beat this thing. You're gonna beat this. And one girl who graduated from here finally, and Maddie, Maddie Hillman, she stayed behind in one of the classrooms. She was the last, everybody had left. She was in the corner crying. And then after she came to me and she says, open your palm, open your palm, I open my palm. And she put her crucifix from uh, uh, her confirmation in my hair, her silver necklace. 
And she says, I want you to hold on to this. I know you've gone through war, you're going to do well, but I want you to hold on to this because it's going to carry you through. And when, when you get out of your treatments and chemo and everything, it, you're going you're gonna to be well. Wear it in surgery. Well, she didn't know you don't wear necklaces when you go into surgery, okay? So she gave it to me and she ran and then I opened my palm and then she wrote me and told me because I have gone through war, she would. And she left Penn State right after I, I left that year. And the year I was gone, she was gone and she went to Juniata. And, but she continued to follow me. And she kept telling me in email that you are going to make it. You are going to make it because you're stronger than you know. And then I made it. And then she wrote back and she said, what do I do now? You're back. And I said, come back. And she came back to Penn State Altona and graduated from here. She came back after a year. The year I was gone, she was gone. And then the year I came back, she came back. And I remember she graduated paying tribute to me. So it affects the students. It gives them encouragement. I've had students who were going to be dropped out. I had students who were into trouble with, with the law. I had students who were being kicked out of school. And they came to me and they thought I could do anything. And then I would go to the chancellor and the chancellor would work it out. And I had several students who would come to me. I would go to the chancellor and the chancellor would allow them to stay and work with them with their tuition and they graduated, you know. So I think um, I affect students and um, the fact that um, the war um, changed me, I am able to use that knowledge and that, that feeling that it gave me for young people to reach them. And I think many of them Many of them. The, the interesting thing is long after students have graduated, I still hear from them. And they say, remember, remember you told me your story. And I knew I got last, last December, I got an email from a young man in um, California. He, he wrote me and said, you don't remember me? I, I was in your class and your story changed my life. And, and now I am writing, I am writing poetry. And I have a book I'm going to be publishing it soon. I sent him my new book, and it took me a while. He's, he even sent me a copy, of, a photo of uh, an image of his Penn State ID for me to remember him, even though he was a black kid. You know, I, I, you don't remember all the black kids in my classes. <laughs> I couldn't remember him, you know. And so, and yes, uh, students, and I have, I mean, I'm not talking about students from my country. And right. thousands of students I have taught. I taught for 10 years before the war and then started. And, and I, it makes a difference when people see that the troubles that we have are not insurmountable, that the troubles we have are for a time. You know, I don't wake up in the morning and worry about when COVID is going to end. I, I wake up in the morning and I say, Today, I am going to have a great day. Uh, that, that is wonderful. Um, you teach creative writing. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you use your personal experience, right? So much of what makes a good creative writer is being able to kind of tap into their passions and their, their lived experiences and be able to tell stories around, around that. I think about the powerful poem that you just shared with us. Um, it, it, it's certainly a poem that um, that taps into the lived experiences that you have that you have had. How how do you get that out of your students? How do you um, get them to think about their lived experiences and write about what's either happened to them, right? Whether it's um, yeah. whether it's tragedy or love or or whatever experiences that they've had. Yeah, students are drawn to you when you are vulnerable, when you allow them to know you are not perfect, that you haven't had a perfect life, that you do cry sometimes. And my students know it. They, let me, so when they, they write, the students, if you come to a class and you tell students, I want you to write about deer hunting, they are not gonna write about deer hunting. They, they don't care. They don't give a heck about your deer hunting idea. 
you you tell this you tell the students it's okay write about write write about pain write about pain write about the rape that you experience write about the divorce that shatter your life write about your drunken father write about your small town they say, oh, my town is so small. There's only one gas station. I tell them, my town had no gas station. It didn't have any street light. My village has no gas station. Okay. We're in hundreds of miles. There's no gas. So forget it. Right. And this, my students do write. I, I have produced poets. We have produced poets. I can't claim all the honor because other people teach them too. We have produced poets in a non in a non graduate campus because when you are real with students, they're real. But let me tell you another thing I know that helps. Students, even from other institutions I've been at, I usually am the first, the girls that know me, to call when they when they ripped. For some reason, they call me. Like sometimes early in the morning, I'm eating and they call me and they say, can you come over? I was raped last night. At one point I thought, why? I came one day and the girl's crying in my office and she said, because you have seen it. Because you make us write about all kinds of things. I know you won't be a friend. I was shocked one year when a student came to me and said, I want you to talk to me, I am going to be having an abortion. Years ago, and I'm like, why am I her mom? And then she says, because you act like my mom. So the students know you are frail, that you, you say, here I am, I'm not a hero. And they, you, they, you tell them, you say, if I, if I survive the war, you can survive the war. If I wrote about it, you can write it, your story. They, they do write tough. Even the students in Africa who didn't see the war, when I teach them, they write stories about being raped by their teachers. In Liberia, they cry as they read those poems. And I tell them, what I say to students is, if you keep the pain inside, you're going to go crazy. You have to get it out. And putting it on paper is empowering. I teach them that. You are empowered when you can admit that somebody you thought you loved raped you last night. You look at it and you, and you, you know it happened, even if the judge doesn't believe it. And most times, those cases don't go anywhere. Now, years ago, we did not have to report those cases. Now we are mandated to report it. The last I heard was years ago, I told this girl, when you tell me this story, I'm going to call the police. And she did. And I had to file with Penn State. And that was so good that we have this system. So, but they also have the freedom now and the liberation to write about it in class. And you know, I was shocked when she wrote about it in class, that girl, that woman. She wrote about it and stood up and read a poem in front of guys and women who were able to hear that a student had been raped, you know? And yes, so these stories, the, the, my life is able to affect my students. I am informed by my experiences and they are also informed by their experiences. And if they can connect to me, they can bring out those stories. Well, Professor Wesley, we are certainly lucky to have you at Penn State. Our, certain, our students are lucky to have you uh, as a professor. Uh, that's all the time that we have today. Thank you so much for sharing your story and your presentation. And I wanna thank everyone else who's joining us today. As a reminder, we'll be hosting additional speaker sessions in the coming weeks and months, and this program is in addition to a wide array of online networking and career events. You can find all of that information on our website at alumni.psu.edu events. Thank you for all you do for the university, 
for the glory and for the future. We are Ben State. <laughs>